In January 1972, televangelist Morris Carullo introduced a young man named Mike Warnke to the evangelical Christian community. Carullo had a rare specimen indeed, a real-life former Satanist who had found Jesus and wanted to share his testimony with the world. Hmm, where have we heard that one before? And he had the ability to do it. Warnke possessed native speaking ability and natural charm, and rapturing revival crowds with no visible effort. And to top it all off, he was funny. Warnke's unique blend of true confession, Christian stand-up comedy, and born-again sermonizing was a winning combination. So winning that, by 1973, Warnke had broken away from Carrillo to form his own Alpha and Omega outreach ministry and publish his autobiography, co-written by Les Jones and David Balsiger, named The Satan Seller. It pushed Warnke into the national Christian spotlight, winning him speaking engagements at some of the most popular evangelical venues in the nation. With his niche firmly established, Warnke enrolled at Trinity Bible College in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in 1975, 1975 that is, his first Christian comedy album, Alive, not to be confused with the Kiss Alive album that came out in the same year. <laughs> anyway, it cemented his fame. Warnke quickly became the best-selling Christian comedian of all time. Despite his checkered past, Warnke seemed stable and well-prepared for ministry. He was a Vietnam vet and married to his college sweetheart the former Sue Studer. The Warnkeys had two little sons. Fellow Christians were amazed at how far he had come in such a short time. Truly, this was God's hand at work. And less than ten years earlier, however, Warnke had been a high priest in a violent satanic cult, a drug dealer, and an addict. He viciously dominated and abused the women in his life, cut himself off from his family, and led his followers into increasingly bizarre and demented behavior. The way he described himself on his Alive album, he was a ruthless gangster junkie. Quote, I'd had hepatitis four times from shooting up with dirty needles. I had scabs all over my face from shooting up crystal. I was a speed freak. I weighed 110 pounds soaking wet. My skin had turned yellow. My teeth were rotting out of my head. I'd been pistol whipped five or six times, my jaw had been broken, my nose had been almost ripped off, I had a bullet hole in my left leg, and two in my right leg. End quote. Keep this in mind, because it will play into the story a little later on. Now, his childhood, while not as tragic as Doreen Irvine's, had been rough nonetheless. Born in 1946, he grew up in Coffee County, Tennessee, son of a truck stop owner named Whitey and his fifth wife. Whitey sold drugs and was mixed up with gangsters. He carried a Tommy gun in his car, which was full of bullet holes from drug deals gone bad. Isn't it funny that uh, the town cops apparently thought nothing of a bullet-riddled car prowling around town? Hell, I can't even get away with a cracked windshield. Anyway, Whitey had affairs with many young women, including a teenage waitress who became his sixth wife after Mark, Mike's uh, mother died in 1955. For the next three years, Mike was at the mercy of a stepmother who whipped him with a dog leash at every opportunity. Oh, wait a minute. Getting whipped with a dog leash by a teenage hottie? God, that must have been awful. <laughs> anyway, Whitey died when Mike was 11 years old. And from then uh, on, Mike lived with his devoutly Christian aunts for a short time, and then their influence stayed with him, just as Doreen Irvine's Sunday school teachers planted the seeds of salvation in her youth. And I'll discuss that in further videos. Then, after that, he was sent to California to live with his half-sister, Shirley Schrader, and family, raised him as a Catholic. Warnke's teen years were typical for a California Catholic boy in the 60s, parties, dances, etc., and he never got into serious trouble, but he loved to tell tall tales 
and act out weird jokes. And this will also play into his continuing story. After graduating from high school in 1965, Warnke enrolled at San Bernardino Valley College, and it was here that he went into the dark side. He had already abandoned church, having been kicked out for asking too many questions. And though he doesn't give very many time markers, um, simple logic would dictate his college days lasted from enrollment in autumn of 1965 and to his joining the Navy in the summer of 1966. This crucial time frame will also play into the continuing story. Keep this in mind because it's also a key piece of evidence in debunking his outlandish story. In the Satan Cellar, Warnke tells us that he was an alcoholic by age 18, and from there graduated to pot, speed, peyote, mescaline, and LSD. He then began attending gatherings where hippies were getting stoned and discussing religion and philosophy before having free love orgies. After attending several of these gatherings, he determined that these people were Satanists and witches, and, just like all the others, he confuses the two even though they are not the same thing. And that their sex and drug parties were nothing but a lure to bring selected people into their satanic coven. His introduction to this uh, satanic coven was extremely gradual unlike the sudden initiation de described by uh, Doreen Irvine. Though Mike's time frame for this story, uh, between the autumn of 1965 to the summer of 1966, he gives us the impression that a significant amount of time passed before he was allowed to proceed to the second level. In the meantime, he became a big-time drug dealer and smuggler for Dean Armstrong. Warnke claimed that the coven was handling a large percentage of the drug traffic for the Inland Empire at the time. The second level meetings consisted of rituals that were blasphemous but surprisingly tame. Initiates learned simple witchcraft. Warnke estimates that there were several hundred regional coven members from all walks of life. He tells us that there were even a few ministers and priests. Warnke itched to explore the deeper mysteries of the group, so he obediently served as Dean's drug gopher and message boy until he was admitted to the third stage. This was the inner sanctum, the core group of real Satanists. Dean revealed that he was one of the leaders, a so-called master counselor. There were three master counselors at a time in a group, which is kind of strange. As far as I've been able to determine, there is only one uh, satanic group that uh, advocates drug dealing, and that is um, the Order of Nine Angles. You can Google search that term, and um, the man who started it, David Myatt, didn't start the Order of Nine Angles until uh, the 80s and 90s, and he has since converted to Islam, which is kind of weird. Warnke's first third stage meeting was a black mass held in a barn near uh, Redlands, California. A nude girl laid on an altar consisting of a granite slab atop two sawhorses, while the three master counselors desecrated the sacraments, uttered blasphemies, and read from the Satanic Bible. Which Warnke calls the Great Mother. Aha, mystery solved, right? Yeah. Remember what I said about in the John Todd series about books that don't exist. Remember Warnke's timeline of autumn of 1965 to summer of 1966? Well, guess what, kids? Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible wasn't published until 1969. And you know what that means, don't you? Yeah. At any rate, the Satanic Bible is a small paperback book you know, kind of like this size. You know, a real thin one. Trade paperback. And it's far less weighty than that described by uh, 
Doreen Irvine. As I've stated before, the alleged worldwide Church of Satan doesn't seem to have any standardized scriptures at all. Each ex-Satanist describes different books, different magical systems, and different modes of worship. You'd think that a secretive global satanic cult hell-bent on world domination would be just a little bit better organized than this. Anyway, at the end of the Black Mass, the Satanists cast curses on enemies. Warnke was so impressed with this that he asked to be initiated as soon as possible. Dean told him he could join the third stage at the next full moon three weeks later. So we now see Warnke's dark side. Up to this point, he was just a drug addict, curious about Satanism. After the third meeting, however, he's a monster. He admits to holding his girlfriend captive in his apartment for a week, using her as a whipping girl, and then throwing her out on the street for no particular reason. Anyway, at his initiation, Mike knelt naked in the center of a circle and knew given a new satanic name, Judas. Oh, how original and imaginative. He was baptized with holy water mixed with urine. He was given a black robe, a hood resembling those worn by Eastern Orthodox priests, a silver ring, and a necklace bearing a zodiac sign. Anybody who knows anything about Satanism uh, they don't give people pendants with their zodiac signs. They usually give them one of these. Strike two. This ceremony bears little resemblance to Dory and Irvine's initiation, which involved drinking the blood of a sacrificed rooster. Yummy. Instead of signing a parchment, Warnke signed his name in blood in a large leather-bound book. Some of the names that were already in it appeared in green ink, and Dean explained that the uh, blood magically turned green as soon as someone betrayed Satan. And this group called itself the Brotherhood. Uh, to his credit, however, Warnke tells us much more about the beliefs and attitudes of satanic witches than Doreen Val or Irvine did. He informs us that Satanists believe in God but reject him in favor of the thrills and short-term benefits that Satan can provide. They have elaborate rituals and spells. They don't just burn Bibles like uh, Doreen's Black Witches did, nor does Warnke claim to have superpowers like uh, Irvine claimed. He can't levitate, kill birds with his mind, or make himself invisible. Well, I'll give him that much. Anyway, but Warnke doesn't get too specific about the exploits of his cult. He doesn't reveal any of the contents of the Great Mother slash the Satanic Bible, as can those of us who have actually read it. Nor does he provide real names and gives only vague descriptions of the meeting places. Warnke tells us that he learned a lot about Satanic witchcraft in a very short time, which is quite amazing since he admittedly was an alcoholic and a drug addict. Hmm. That kind of makes somebody a little learning disability, you know? Yeah. First, a female witch revealed to Warnke that the powers of spells, curses, and potions came from demons. These demons had been pressed into service by their master Satan and performed their task reluctantly. So if any rule was broken or any mistake made, the demon could lash out violently against you. This is in direct uh, contradiction to the teachings of groups like uh, the Joy of Satan, Order of Nine Angles, and others who insist that Satan and the demons are happy to help their worshippers grow and develop spiritually. Anyways, the witch claimed that uh, an enraged demon had clawed her forehead once, leaving a nasty scar. Later, Warnke learned that two Satanists had been crushed to death by an invisible force because they careless, carelessly stepped on a, the wrong part of the circle during a ceremony. Next, Dean made it clear that he was expected to go out and recruit new members. 
In stages, he would lure them to a female witch's apartment for sex, then offer drugs, and then ease them into witchcraft. He also supposedly cruised the bars for marks, or unsuspecting new recruits. Warnke, Warnke claims that he brought a thousand people into the Brotherhood in this manner. 